Well, tonight we want to continue our deacon leadership training. We'll be in session four. You have your notes in front of you there. Let's just review quickly our, our objectives. Uh, this session is managing a project part one. We're going to talk about projects uh, for at least two sessions. So here's what we want to do tonight. We'll begin our study in managing a project by reviewing session three, our last session. Then we'll move to discuss the steps required to carry out a project. What are the steps that we go through to execute on a project? And then we're going to start talking about best practices for managing projects. So when we get to those steps, what are the, what are the things we need to be looking out for, the best, um, best practices in those areas? Okay, let's review session three here briefly because we're going to build on that here in session four. In session three, we talked what, about projects. We just had an introduction to projects, and we talked about the uh, five parts of, or components of projects. Anybody remember any of those? You can cheat and look at your notes maybe. First, there's the scope, right? There's the scope. The scope is the total picture of what the project is about. What is this project? What is the scope? And then the second is the time frame. The time frame is just when are we going to try and start this and when are we going to finish this. The third is resources. <laughs> the tools, money, etc. needed to complete the project. Fourthly is components. The smaller parts of the project that make up the whole. And then we have order or sequence. The sequence of action. The steps that we have to take in order to complete the project. So that's really what we talked about. We talked about those five. And then we went through and we looked at the errors that are made. The common errors that are made in carrying those out. Now, we're not really going to go through those now because we went through those the last time. But what we want to do now is go and build on and start talking about managing projects. The steps to carry out or manage a project. And I've got five of those too. Five steps to carry out or manage a project. Let me identify them for you here. Number one is identify the project elements Identify the project elements, and that's the, what we just talked about. So if, when you're going to start a project, you've got to first identify all the elements, scope, time frame, and so on. We'll, we'll talk about that briefly in a moment. The second thing you have to do is you have to recruit volunteers. You've got to get some help. Now, some projects might be small enough where you don't need but just one or two guys, but we have to get really good at recruiting volunteers. Have you noticed how in our church there seem to be 15, 20 people who each have three or four different jobs. So we got to get better at, at recruiting people to help us. The third is delegate, delegation, delegating work. That would be getting others involved, giving them work to do, sharing work with other people. All right? And then fourth, we have to track, manage, and motivate our workers. We've got to keep up with what they're doing. It doesn't do us any good to lay out all the elements of the project and then recruit the volunteers and then delegate work to them and then not pay any attention to what's being done. Okay, so we're going to talk about that in a little more detail as well. And then the fifth thing we have to do is we have to overcome obstacles. Any of you, and I know all of you have been in charge of a project in some form or another, whether it's you here you are trying to get a roof on or or Ali in your former project management life with uh, was CMI, and Josh in your work at churches and all the other things that you've done, you end up every single project has obstacles. We've got to really address that. So what I want to do over the next two sessions is dig into the meat of these and talk about what they are and talk about some best practices and things to look out for, things to do, things not to do, to try and make all of us a little bit better at actually executing on a project and managing a project. All right, that's what we want to do. Now we're going to deal with the first three tonight. And then we'll look at these two in the next session or sessions. I'm not sure if I'm going to split this up and do one at a time because each of these have so much in them or if I'm just going to do them in one. So this is what we want to do. We're going to look at these three tonight in some detail. Step one, identify project elements. You know, we're not going to spend a great deal of time on this tonight because really we talked about this in our last session. We just reviewed it from session three. We talked about those five pieces. We talked about some, uh, some errors that are made in those. So we're not going to cover this in a lot of detail tonight. I would say that overall, this isn't where you run into most of your problems 
in the larger projects in the church, identifying the elements. Yeah, we need to get good at that. We need to spend the time on that. But most of the time, it's those next four where we run, really run into the trouble, getting people to help us, delegating work, and so on. So the problems come up in those other four areas. Really, all I want to emphasize here again to you is that once you become the manager of a project, once you become the lead on something, put the time in there. Put the time in there. We emphasized that a couple of times in our last session. Don't skip it. Uh, get, get thorough. Get deep. Spend a lot of time in there. Don't skip that step. Invest uh, up front so your project will go well and you won't frustrate your workers. All right? Because this is where we start frustrating our workers a lot when, we, when we're not ready. When we're not ready to manage the project. All right? So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. One. We're just going to pull this one off of here. Okay, so recruit volunteers. Let's talk about recruiting volunteers. Recruiting volunteers simply means that we want to get people on board to help us. Get people on board to help us. So here let me ask you, let's just put this out here, let's have a little discussion here. So, so let me give you a, just a few thoughts that I have on this, all right? And, and this fits in with what you guys were saying already. And, and the first thing I would say is we're talking about best practices, things to do. And the first thing I would say is recruit who you want. Recruit who you want. You're only as good as your team. You're only as good as your team. Don't just recruit anybody. Get the best guys for the job. The best guys for the job. Who are the best guys for the job? Get the guy you know who can do the job. First of all, you mentioned earlier, you're talking about you need people with the right skills. So if you're looking for a construction project, the best team member is going to be somebody who can do construction. When we, Ali and I, were talking about this youth classroom, we, we started talking about who, who can do this, and, and Luke came up because he does it for a living. So we wanted Luke on the team. We had some, some other guys that knew some stuff, but, but Luke really knew what he was talking about, so we wanted to get Luke. It doesn't do you any good to get a guy who doesn't know anything about construction. Now, you may be able to use him as a helper, and that might be good, but get the guy you know can do the job. How about this? Get the guy who will not give you any issues. Think about this. If, if a guy is late to church all the time, why is he going to be on time for your project? Don't recruit a bad volunteer. Get somebody who won't give you any issues. If the guy is always making excuses, and you know people like that, why is he not going to make them with you? He will. So you want the best men, not the most men. You have to, you have to while we, you, know, you talked about your example of people being desperate for help, we just want any body we can get. You know? And I understand that, especially when you feel like, you're doing all the work, and if you don't get some help, you don't know what you're going to do. But what good does it do if we don't get the, good, the best team, right? I mentioned this verse to you the last time we talked, but I want to bring it up again. Proverbs 25, 19. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a bad tooth and a foot out of joint. A bad tooth, painful, and no use to you, a, a joint... Uh, foot out of joint, you can't walk on it, you can't do anything with it. The, a, a guy who won't do what he's supposed to do when you need him to do it is just like that. He's no good to you. He's nothing but a source of pain. And bad volunteers discourage other volunteers, don't they? Bad team members discourage other team members. And when we get down a little bit later and we're talking about overcoming obstacles, we're talking about tracking and managing uh, volunteers, one of the things that we have to talk about is what do you do with somebody who's not doing what they're supposed to? Because one of the ways to discourage your other team members is to let somebody not carry their weight and just let it go. So we'll get to that when we get to it. But we need, we need to make sure that we're not recruiting bad volunteers. Let me give you two, two other ways of, of recruiting bad volunteers. Guaranteed bad volunteers if you do this. What about when we try to recruit volunteers based on guilt? You ever heard that? Somebody says, you're a member of the church. You ought to be helping with this. Guilt. Something like that. Have you ever heard that? 
Or how about this? this is the, so that's one, guilt. The second way of guaranteeing a bad volunteer or giving yourself a pretty good possibility of having one is to pester people. Ask them over and over again. Over and over again. You know? You keep asking them. Uh, good intention, well-intentioned Christians make this mistake with new visitors or new members because they will ask them over and over to come to the Sunday break or Saturday breakfast. They'll ask them over and over to come to Sunday school. They'll ask them over and over and over to do whatever. It's well-intentioned, but you can't pester people. Why are these bad? Why is it bad to guilt people and to pester them? Why is that a bad strategy? What kind of motivation are they going to have to continue in that project and do well? They're not going to have any, that's not the kind of motivation you want, right? So they're going to have this really weak motivation. They're going to be, like you said, resentful, bitter. They want to avoid you. And so what are you going to have? You have a problem. All right, so recruit who you want. And then I mentioned this last time. We'll hit this briefly. Recruit directly. There's certainly a place for the, for the call, the general call. You know, stand up in front of the congregation and say, we need help. But, but usually that general call is a call to no one in particular. And so you can kind of just duck and go, oh, that, they're, they're not talking to me. So go to the specific men you want. If you need somebody on the team, go to the person and ask, hey, can you help us with this? What is the benefit of going directly to someone face-to-face -face and saying, hey, can you help us with this? You can get an answer right away if they'll give you one, yes. But isn't it more powerful when somebody walks up to you and says, we need you, can you help us? That's different than standing in front of the congregation. It's, it's much more personal. I won't say it's harder to say no, but it's just, it's a, it's a stronger sort of emotional connection that you make when you ask them directly. Go to them specifically. Now, I also recommended something. You mentioned Stan... You could get an answer right away, and sometimes that you can. But what happens if that person won't give you an answer right then? What did I recommend to you in our last session when we talked about recruiting just briefly? Put a timeline on it. Just say, I understand. You know, I understand you need to think about it. Could, could, could you possibly tell me maybe by Sunday if you could do it? That's how you want to do that because you don't want to be on the hook all along, and you don't want to be standing back going, well, I don't want to bug them. I don't want to pester them. But you're kind of getting permission to say, you know, give me an answer. And then you can go up and just ask them, hey, were you able to think about that? And if they, and if they still hem and haw then, what should you do? Move on. Move on. If they're hemming and hawing, you don't want them. Obviously, they're not, they really don't want to do that. So recruit directly. We're not going to spend much time on that one. All right, now these two are, these two are key here. Explain the purpose and the need. When you're recruiting... Explain the purpose and the need. This is part of how you, I don't want to say um, sell them on what you're trying to do, but it's part of how you draw them in. You need to tell them what you are trying to do and why you are trying to do it. All right? What are we trying to do? This helps you motivate them to participate. Let me give you an example from Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. We used Nehemiah in our last session to sort of parallel what we're, what we're trying to do. In Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah sends, uh, asked for a report on Jerusalem. In chapter 1, he asked for what, what happened. And then they told him the, the, the wall is destroyed, the gates are burned with fire, our people are a reproach. And Nehemiah sits down and he cries and he weeps and he prays. And then the Lord gives him an opportunity to tell the king what's wrong, and then the king sends him to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. All right, but when he gets there in chapter 2, I want, you to, I want to read this to you. I want you to see how he motivates the men and women of the city to help him. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Then I said to them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. So look what he's doing here, okay? He's showing them, he's telling them what, but he's also telling them why. 
See the distress we are in. See the problem. Jerusalem is in waste. Its gates are run with fire. Come, let us build that we may no longer be a reproach. See how he's motivating? Do you want to be embarrassed by this anymore? Isn't this embarrassing? Isn't it embarrassing that all our seats are empty on Sunday? Is it embarrassing that we don't have but a few youth over there? Isn't that embarrassing that we can't get any young people to come to church? Let's rise up. Let's rebuild this. You see what he's doing? And then what happened? He didn't have to tell them to do it then. Do you notice what the Bible says here? So they said, let us rise up and build. They said. So we need to tell people what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. So let's go back to our classroom examples because it's just an easy one for me to, to pick. When you go to someone and you're asking them, what do you want to say? This is, hey, can you help us? We want to build two classrooms over. That's the what. Okay, but the why. Why are we? We're building two new rooms in the student building for extra student classes. We can also use them to grow our Sunday school down the road. We're trying to build the church and grow the church, and we need to do this project so we can do that. Will you help us with that? Do you see? This is what we're doing, but this is why we're doing it. And it pulls them into something bigger than just putting up two by fours. You see that? So when we're talking about our, tonight, later on, we talk about our emergency plan. What are we doing is we're trying to get prepared for an emergency, but why? So we can feed our people. If everything goes south, we can provide medical care. We can take care of our sheep in an emergency. You know, that's why. So give them the purpose and the need. All right. And then finally, this is one that I make a mistake on here. Explain the limits of the work. Now, this is really hard in a small church when you're overwhelmed and you've got so many things to do and so few people. But what you want to try to do is give this person a date and a time and specifically what you need them to do. Like in the case of, of Luke on that Saturday, we... 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock on this particular Saturday, we're getting together and we're building. And we need you to lead the team and, and show us how to put the wall up properly and, and all of that. All right? You tell them what you need them to do. Lay it out for them. Carve it out. And this is the part where I make, I've, I've made errors. I've made it even recently. Afterwards, stick to what you told them the best you can. Don't change the scope on them. And I've done it recently. I did it to you. I did it to Dana. What happens is in a small church, you get a small thing. Hey, can you do this for me? And you don't realize that that small thing leads to two or three other things. And then you assume that that person's going to keep doing it without actually asking them. You know? And so I've had to go back and talk again and talk to my wife and talk to Josh and say, hey, you know, this is becoming more than, than, than I initially said. You know, can you keep helping me with this? All right? So give them, explain the limits of it, and try to keep it. Try to keep to it as best you can. If something else comes up, make sure you talk to them so that you don't frustrate them or make them feel like, uh, you know, if, if, I, if I say yes to, to, to this guy, I'm going to be in for all kinds of work that I didn't even think I was going to be in for. You see what I'm saying? So, so think about that. All right, so let's talk about delegating now. Step three is delegating to others. Delegate is really sharing work with others, giving other people important work to do. That's the first point that I want to make here about delegating is don't try to do it all yourself. Now, there are things that you just jump in and you just knock it out real quick and get it done. But to, to pick up on Josh's point, we're talking about an entire organization that we're trying to develop here. We're not just trying to get two or three little things done at the house and so we can kick back in the Barker lounger and watch football. We're talking about developing an entire uh, uh, church here, an entire congregation. It may seem faster, but you cannot get as much done by yourself as you can with properly trained and motivated and managed people. Right? You can't get as much done. And also, if you try to do it all yourself, what eventually happens to you? You get burned out. You get burned out. All right, so there are, there are ramifications of, of trying to do it all yourself. We must make it a part of our process as deacons. Because remember, we're in the administration business. 
And our first and really only example in the Bible of what the deacons did was a food network for thousands of people. So these, these are men who have to jump right in and get organized and use other people fast. All right? If this church is going to grow, if this church is going to get more done, think about this emergency plan. I mean, we're going to talk about it later, but just the scope of what needs to really need to do to make this effective is monstrous. We, we've got to start somewhere at getting other people involved. We must train others. Train others. That has to be a part of our culture, each individually, that we are going to take other men and train them on what we know so that they will know it and then they can do it. 2 Timothy 2.2. Everybody's heard this a million times, but just think about the wisdom in it. Paul said to Timothy, the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses. Okay, Timothy, I spoke and you heard from me. You learned from me. I want you to commit these to faithful men who then can teach others. See that? So from Paul to Timothy to other men. And you notice the term faithful there. We're going to talk about that idea here in a moment. You see that? It's a direct command for ministers of the gospel to train other men. That we are not to be lone rangers in our work for the Lord. We have to train others. It's a very critical part of keeping the kingdom moving. Yes, it takes more time up front, doesn't it? It does. Now, I have two, two sons. One's 21 and one is 18. And for the last five or six years, I have been teaching them stuff. And I always wrestle with the question of, oh, I can just get this done. And, and it's hard for me to... It, it, it causes you to have to grow a lot individually to train someone new. You have to learn patience. You have to learn how to explain things. You have to learn how to let other people make mistakes. You, it's so much growing you have to do to teach other men what to do. But what I've noticed now is I can say I've taught them all, Corbin included, how to, to uh, change a flat tire, how to plug a tire. So I'll say, uh, Silas, so like if the... If I see the tires look low, I'll say, Silas, go out and check all the tires and pump them all up. He knows how to check them. He knows where to look inside the door and see what the pressure is supposed to be. He knows how to cut the uh, air compressor on. He knows how to pump it up. He knows how to check it. He knows to put the caps on. I just say, go out and do that. I'll say, uh, you guys go out there and take that tire off and see if there's a nail in it. They know how to do it. The, Dana, Dana had a, a flat tire few weeks ago when she was out with Silas and I was like she called me we had a flat tire we don't know what to do and I was like I was thinking well how can I get there how can I get there you know and then I thought no Silas is with you I said are you in a safe place yes we're off the side of the road we're, we're no traffic I said well Silas can change that tire but the point is see that is an extension of me because I taught him but if I hadn't taken the time and the pain and the rear and and you know how young people are they want to do a halfway. They don't want to, oh, Dad, I'm going to complain. Okay? Then I, then I wouldn't have been able to do that. Now, here's very important for you men here. This step here of delegating and training others is probably the most significant transition that you can make from being a worker to being a true leader. If you're doing it all yourself, you're, you're not a leader. And you're not going to get anything done. You're, you're really not. You're just a guy who will go out there and if you take somebody with you, you'll just make them mad. <laughs> Recognizing and investing in using others to get work done is a significant step that we must make to be the leaders that God needs us to be. Does that make sense? So we have to apply ourselves to getting better at that. So don't try and do it all yourself. Train others. Any thoughts or comments on that? Very, very critical. All right. 
Now I want to pick up on this word faithful men here from 2 Timothy 2.2 2, in this final point tonight. And I want to just go back and, and state something similarly, but I'm going to have a different uh, application for it. Select the right man to delegate to. Select the right man to delegate to. What do I mean by this? We talked earlier about choosing the right man in terms of his skills. Make sure you're, you know, if, you, if you're doing construction, get a guy who can do construction. We talked about getting the right man in terms of, you know, he's, he's, not, he's going to show up on time and he's, you know, that kind of thing. That, but, but here's what I want to emphasize here. That word faithful that Paul uses in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2, I want to emphasize the need to delegate to men who are dependable and committed. Dependable and committed. Nehemiah 7.2, going on in, in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is getting ready to leave now. He's going to go back uh, to, Jerusalem, or to, to see the king. And he says this. He says, I gave charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hanani, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. You see, he had to delegate a very significant, important task, the management of Jerusalem. Now, he had come here and he had completed this project of rebuilding that wall, and he wanted to leave it in the best hands he could so that the work he had done would not fall apart. So he had to choose a man, the right kind of man. There's that word faithful again. Faithful man who feared God more than many. This ties into Paul's discussion of the character requirements of deacons. Do you remember I said that I wasn't going to just go necessarily down the list of 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 11, I think it is, and just go through the requirements. But here's where I want to tie it in. Here's what Paul says about deacons in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. He says they must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money. Let's look at these words here. Reverent means honored for character, not double-tongued. That's saying one thing to one person and another, something else to someone else, deceitful. So they're, so they're reverent, they have great character, they don't go around deceiving people and saying one thing to one and another to another. They're not given to much wine. What does that mean? What does that say about a man when he's not given over to the drink? He's disciplined, isn't he? He's self-disciplined. He's going to say, no, I'm not going to let that control me. And he's not greedy for money. He can't be controlled by riches. What is that saying? All of those have to do with character, don't they? Dependability and commitment. Let me share something with you that, that I've come to conclude after 25 years in all these different churches and experiences that I've had. In my experience, the hardest thing to find is not a man who has the skill to do something needed. It is to find a man that is so committed to the Lord that he is willing to do whatever it takes to get the Lord's work done. That is the hardest thing to find. I wonder sometimes if we have not just the numbers of people we need to rebuild the kingdom, but the quality of people that we need. It's not just numbers, it's the quality. I look around and see so many men and women, many of whom have been with the Lord many years, and I see so much immaturity, so much self-centeredness, so much unwillingness to sacrifice, so much excuse-making, so much unprofessionalism, so much accepting things in the church they would never accept in their job. I honestly wonder if the Lord has simply withdrawn His grace to overcome all the obstacles that we have because of generations of unfaithful men and women that have come before us. You see, you look now and you see all the work that needs to be done in this church. I want you to think about this. Dana mentioned this to me the other day. In 20 years, both of you will be gone. Two of the four men in this room will be gone more than likely in 20 years. 
In 20 years, we've got, say we've got 40 people who are average on Sunday morning attendance. How many of them will be gone in 20 years out of 40? 30? You see, if we, if we don't start rebuilding this thing now, there won't be anything to hand over in 20 years. You see? There won't be anybody to give it to. There'll be nothing left. That's just the math of it. But this is how we can start to multiply. You see? God sends us someone, and we take them under our wing. I've taken, don't, don't take this the wrong way, this is a young man here in the ministry, okay? And I have done everything I can to come close to him and to pull him in to my, to my, to my life. We meet, we talk, we pray, we share. I've done everything I can to invest in him, you know, and help him. And he's helped me, all right? But who are, who are you doing that with? Who are you doing that with? And then I want him, when some, the Lord needs on someone else, he, he has taken my son Asa out to lunch and start to mentor him, develop him, you see? And then we want Asa, you see? If we, if we do this hard part here of starting to train other people and really take advantage of the ones that God sends us one will become two, and two will become four, and eight, and twelve, and, and then we get a ch church full of people, and then we start another church somewhere, doing the same thing, and another church somewhere. And then churches start to come to us and ask, what are you guys doing? How are you doing this? And all of a sudden, the numbers get big real fast, you see? Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much an empty place in here, so many, much of the time. And that's a little discouraging. But it doesn't have to be that way. Okay? We, we can do it. I hope you and those who hear these words will prove to be the ones that return the grace of God to us by not being like so many of those who preceded us. You see, if they had done their job in this, we wouldn't have so many empty chairs. 